Okay. Hello? Yes. Hi. What? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yes. Oh, bring him to joy. Thank you. Nineteen fifteen in Italy has just joined the First World War. It sided with the Ontario. Okay. Bombing Italy. Nineteen fifteen. 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 Nineteen fifte
marched on Rome. Mussolini wasn't there himself, though. He was in Milan, ready to flee to Switzerland if it all went wrong. Victor Emmanuel III was asked to sign an order allowing the army to open fire on the Blackshirts. The king, for reasons unknown, did not, and the next day he made Mussolini the prime minister. So the proportional representation system used in Italian elections meant that no party ever won a majority. Mussolini, along with many others, sought to change this, and a man called Giacomo Acerbo put forward a law known as the Acerbo Law, which meant that the winning party in any future elections would get a clear majority of seats. This law was supported by most parties for two reasons. The first was that everyone hated the current electoral system since it made weak governments. The second, and arguably main reason they supported the law, was the armed black shirts who were in the room with them. Another election was held in 1924, with Mussolini and the fascist party standing for the first time at the head of a right-wing coalition. They won about 65% of the vote, and there's a lot of debate as to how clean the elections were. There was certainly violence against Mussolini's opponents, but he was also very popular, and many Italians were hoping he would fix the country's problems. The head of the socialist opposition, Giacomo Matteotti, spoke out against Mussolini's victory, saying it was tainted by the violence inflicted by his followers. Shortly after this, Matteotti was kidnapped and murdered by fascist blackshirts. The murder of Matteotti forced many of Mussolini's coalition partners to abandon him, and it looked like his grip on power was slipping. The fascist membership wanted Mussolini to be more extreme and hostile to his coalition partners, whereas Mussolini didn't want to lose more support in the Chamber of Deputies, which was becoming more and more difficult since he was directly implicated in Matteotti's murder. As such, he took a major risk. On January the 3rd, 1925, Mussolini walked into the Chamber of Deputies and dared anyone to remove him. Nobody did. This is seen as the end of liberal Italy and the beginnings of fascist Italy, but the difference wasn't immediate, and in many ways there was little difference at all. Conservatives and liberals were still being appointed to positions of authority. That said, Mussolini did become a dictator. In late 1925, he went from being the Prime Minister of Italy to being the head of the government, although he's better known by his other title, Il Duce, the leader. The next year, after a few assassination attempts, he banned all opposition parties, had Gramsci arrested and enacted strict press censorship. The new regime began a fierce propaganda campaign and sought to present Mussolini as an unassailable leader in the same vein as the old Roman emperors. Mussolini's first goal was to fix Italy's ailing economy. He sought to increase the levels of industrialization across Italy, which were far behind the other great powers. Mussolini also sought to win several economic battles to secure Italy's position as a leading nation, the two most important being the Battle for Grain and the Battle for the Lira. The Battle for Grain was designed to make Italy self-sufficient in grain production. The battle for the lira was meant to make the lira more valuable as an international currency, which would make importing certain resources on which Italy lacked more feasible. Mussolini also made an agreement with Pope Pius XI to settle the Roman question. The Pope didn't recognise Italian sovereignty over him, and Mussolini cut him a deal. We'll give you some money, you'll stop openly criticising fascism, and the Vatican will gain its independence. They agreed, and in 1929 the Vatican City became the world's smallest independent country. Furthermore, Mussolini's government encouraged encouraged people to take up sports and also urged women to have more children. All of the aforementioned changes largely didn't work and made life worse for many Italians, but it was seen as their duty to endure for the sake of Italy. Their endurance would ideally see Italy recapture its old glory from the days of the Roman Empire. Mussolini had promised the Italian people that he would rebuild the Roman Empire for them, which is why he had ambitions on all of these countries. To the north lay Austria, who everyone knew that Germany under a certain Adolf Hitler wanted to annex. In 1935, Mussolini signed a treaty with France and Britain, known as the Stresa Front, which guaranteed Austrian independence. You see, Mussolini didn't really like the Nazi regime in Germany, and the whole German master race thing made him uncomfortable because he, you know, wasn't a German. The Stresa Front fell apart when Italy invaded Abyssinia, nowadays called Ethiopia, which was conquered by 1937. Mussolini also sent volunteers to fight in the Spanish Civil War, and in this conflict and the previous, Hitler had given Italy Germany support, and relations between the two countries improved. Mussolini now felt that Britain and France's time had come and gone and that Europe would now revolve around the Rome-Berlin axis, hence where the Axis powers get their name. Italy and Germany continued their united front over the coming years. In 1938, Italy sided with Germany over the annexation of Austria and its later dismemberment of Czechoslovakia. Germany sided with Italy in 1939 when it sent an ultimatum to King Zog of Albania to accept Italian overlordship. He refused, but there was nothing that Albania could do, and so, annexation. In May of 1939, Italy and Germany signed the Pact of Steel, an alliance in which both countries promised to help the other out in the event of war. On September the 1st, 1939, Germany invaded Poland Poland, and suddenly, World War II. Mussolini wouldn't bring Italy into the war until mid-1940, after the fall of Paris. In the October of 1940, Mussolini came up with a brilliant idea. Let's invade Greece. 
This was, to put it mildly, a complete disaster and Italian troops were trounced by the Greeks which forced the Germans to come down and bail them out. And over the next couple of years things got much worse. The tide of the war turned against the Axis powers. Italy lost its colonies in East Africa, lost many troops aiding with the invasion of the Soviet Union and, after the Battle of El Alamein, lost its Libyan colony in mid-1943. Sicily, then Italy proper, was invaded shortly after this and in September 1943 Mussolini was deposed and arrested. Germany then occupied the north of Italy and set up a puppet state, the Italian Soviet Social Republic, which was led by Mussolini because he managed to escape. The rest of Italy, under Victor Emmanuel III, joined the Allies and declared war on Germany. The Italian Social Republic was plagued by issues of partisans, Italians who resisted Mussolini's rule and they did a great deal of damage to its war effort. By April 1945, the front lines looked like this and on the 25th of that month, the Republic collapsed. Two days later, Mussolini was captured by partisans and shot the next day. The war, and fascist Italy, was over. In the aftermath of fascist Italy, not much changed. The same liberals and conservatives who had been given power by Mussolini retained it after the war. Of course, Italy did see a return to democracy and in 1946 it held a referendum on the monarchy's existence. Victor Emmanuel had abdicated on behalf of his son, Umberto II, to make the monarchy more appealing, but the Italian people voted to abolish the monarchy in 1946. And thus, the Republic of Italy was born. I hope you enjoyed this episode and thank you for watching. And a special thanks to Winston okay. K. with James. So that's um, Mussolini. Let's move on to Joseph Stalin. And yeah, the Italians are going to kill Mussolini when he doesn't get them all that land that he promised. So let's go to Joseph Stalin here. So on your computers, open the Stalin, I think it says notes. I'm going to pull up the PowerPoint and you guys pull up the notes. Oh, okay. It's under Stalin. And then you're going to open the notes. I'm going to open this. Okay, so I'm giving you the answers to the notes in this in this slide. All right, Joseph Stalin, um, leader of the Soviet Union. So the Soviet Union um, happens after World War One. Um, or during the Russian Revolution, okay? It's basically just another name for Russia, but they're going to call it the Soviet Union now. Um, and they have their main country, USSR, and then like little satellite ally countries. Um, okay, so Joseph Stalin, here's some statistics on him. Um, he imprisoned millions in something called the Gulag, which I'm going to show you a picture of. Uh, it's a torture chamber, basically. Um, or it has them. Um, six to seven million people killed by a forced famine to starve the people. Millions executed. And then um, 46 million people dispatched to forced labor camps. Oh, yeah. Um, final death toll is unknown, but is estimated to be between 20 and 60 million people died in Stalin. Okay, the Holocaust is 6 to 8 million. Joseph Stalin was responsible for 20 to 60 million. All right, so Joseph Stalin gained popularity with his plan, which is called the five-year plan. Um, which was to transfer our country with its back, with its backward and in part medieval technology onto the lives of new modern technology. That sounds good, he gained popularity. The fundamental path of the five-year plan is to create in our country an industry that would be capable of re-equipping 
and reorganizing not only industry as a whole, but also transport and agriculture on the base, basis of socialism. Okay, so the um, communist revolution, the Russian revolution, ended with the new system in place in Russia. Um, for the Soviet Union. They are now communists. Um, socialism is a little bit different from communism, but basically it means, um, well, they're often the communist party, but socialism means the government owns everything. The government owns the factories, um, owns all the goods, and you're getting stuff from the government. And they tell you what you can have. Okay. Um, okay, so Vladimir Lenin was the um, was the president after the Russian Revolution. Um, and out of all his staff, um, Stalin had everyone else murdered. So that he can gain power. Okay. So any competition, he's going to have them killed. Well, here's some propaganda pictures. Um, and then your quote Death is the solution to all problems. No man, no problem. No problem. <laughs> There he is, Leon Rice right again, leader of the people, happy people. There's no one, not even myself. So the main reason for all the executions under Stalin is paranoia. He's, he's afraid of everyone's going to try to take power from him. He's not going to get it in the first place. Paranoia is the reason for most of these deaths. It's not a racial thing. It's a political thing, it's paranoia. Okay, five years plan. Okay, so when it died in 1924, who would take power? I know that's a question I'm saying. Right on the note thing, throw in the link. There's two main people that would be. Len Trotsky or Joseph Stalin? Well, Stalin has Trotsky. That's it, Stalin. Okay. Um, what does it mean? It means man of steel. So Stalin's goal is to rebuild Russia after the revolution and make it one. When I'm looking under your shoulder, I'm just trying to see what your worship says. Modernized and fired. 
five year plan is um, aimed at building heavy industry. He's actually going to manufacture a lot of steel, iron and steel. That can be used for weapons, transportation, and all those kind of things. He also wants to increase farm output, so increase the amount of food. All good, all good. Okay, so now under this this new USSR, newish USSR, all economic activities are under government control. Okay, so um, the government's going to tell people what to make, how much to make, and then what they, you know, a lot of times they didn't even give them money, they gave them like a coupon for bread. You can go to the store and eat your coupon for bread. That's what the government said you could have. There was some money, but like groceries, you got your, your rations basically. So if you didn't want, you know, apples, that's the only fruit you want to have because the apples you can't get. You, you have to get what they tell you to get. Okay. Stolen, set goals that must be met. And, and in business, it's called a quota. Meet your quota. Um, you guys, if anyone wants to reach now, we can for that before. You can sell so many things to meet your quota. Uh, workers who received, uh, who succeeded, received bonuses. Workers who do not were punished. And they could be punished by not getting their grocery slips or their money, or maybe they're sent to the food box. Um, which I will show you in a little bit. Okay, so the so be successful in oil, steel, and coal growing. Um, so, even though coal and iron production is seemingly, since the government owns everything, no one got rich. Standard of living is still poor. Um, we didn't focus on producing things for the people, it was things for the government. So people are not, they're not happy. You know how many studies you can do? We can steal coal, transportation, but none of the benefits are going to be. Okay. Okay, so Solomon's also going to take over the farm. Um, he's forced uh, peasants to give up their land to the government. And now these um, farms are going to be called collectives. And this whole process is called collectivism. The collectivization. Uh, 
then the peasants need to work them and make their quota or they're going to be punished. Okay, peasants were allowed to keep their personal possessions, but all of the farming stuff was given to the government. So if you think about it, these people probably have been farmers for generations, their family farms. And that's what they've done their whole life. And their parents and their parents and the government comes in and takes it. And they have nothing they can do about it. Government said prices and quotas. Yeah, they, they control everything in the economy. Okay, there's a revolt. The peasants revolt by killing farm animals, destroying tools, equipment, and burning crops. Okay, so they're revolting against Stalin's policy. So, how's Stalin going to react? Well, he's going to starve these people to death. Okay. So, that's seven million deaths um, to the farmers that revolted. Were respected and revolting, were cited to be revolters, had a brand that was a revolter. Um, they're not going to be given food. The government now has all the food. They're not going to be given food. That's a bad way to die. Um, so, this is a fear tactic, and it does increase Stalin's control, but the farms aren't producing better. Attitude. In fact, um, what we found out is like you know psychology is that in order to improve a quota in any business, the workers have to be happy. Fear doesn't work, doesn't motivate. And it motivates you to not get trouble or not to do your best. Okay, it was the official policy of the Soviet Union to deny the existence of a famine and thus refused any outside assistance. Anyone claiming that there was in fact a famine was accused of spreading anti-Soviet propaganda. Inside the Soviet Union, a person could be arrested for using the word famine or hunger or starvation. Yeah, total censorship. Great curve. Okay. In in this, curve is going to mean to eliminate opposition. So anyone in his way, anyone who questions him or is in his way, he's got to get rid of them.
Okay. So during this purge, um, he, he was legitimately afraid that people were plotting against him. So out of fear, uh, he accuses thousands of people of treason, crimes against the government, and has them killed. Oh, the reign of terror. Um, okay, so other people that Stalin fear, writers, writers could influence people, teachers could be teaching the wrong thing, army heroes, the Bolsheviks, which is um, another communist group. Okay, he has big public trials that are already, you know, set up to go his way. Um, they're called show trials. And many of the accused were tortured, executed, or sent to prison camps. Is there any more questions left on your thing? Okay, so let me show you. Um, let me show you some of this stuff. Show you a gulag. The gulag, let's find some pictures. Okay. So the gulag is um, a forced labor camp. Here we go. That was a good picture. You know, um, similar to the concentration camps in um, the Holocaust, of course, they did, these did not have gas chambers like the Holocaust did, but they're forced labor camps. You work or you die. Okay, here's one of the tactics for someone that wasn't cooperating in the gulag is if you can like imagine tying your arms behind you and hanging you from them. That was a torture tactic. And all of this is, you know, very visible to the others to, to make them fear. Okay, and, and millions die. So the causes of the deaths of Stalin were are mixed. It's being put in the gulag and worked to death or starved to death or just executed because of his paranoia. Okay. Yikes. Okay, 
torture chambers. Oh, here's real pictures, not drawings. Yeah, those drawings are horrific. Um, Okay, so that's Joseph Stalin. Um, he's going to be the leader of Russia at the start of World War II, and he's going to be a friend to the United States. Okay? The United States is going to partner with this guy. And Winston Churchill from England. So we're going to partner with this guy. Why do you think we would partner with this? Okay, we have a few minutes, so no, not the French one. This video is sponsored by World of Warships, a free to play naval warfare themed online game. Download it today using the link in the description. New players will receive 1 million credits, the USS Langley Premium Aircraft Carrier, three days premium time, and more using my code PlayLangley2019. Big thanks to Wargaming for sponsoring this video. Joseph Stalin, one of the most feared men of the 20th century, ruled by his enemies and his own citizens, many of which he in fact considered his enemies, responsible for sequestering off large parts of Europe under the Iron Curtain and for fueling fears of international nuclear war. Just how did this man come to be one of the most notorious figures in history? Born in 1878 as Yosef Visarionovich Zukashvili, Stalin grew up an only child and son of a poor peasant family. His father was a shoemaker and an alcoholic. Holly, who vented his frustrations out on his son with regular meetings, and his mother was a laundress doing laundry for others to earn enough for the family to survive. Contracting smallpox as a child, Stalin would be disfigured for life with his signature facial scars, which only added to his tough exterior demeanor. Surprisingly, Stalin earned a scholarship as a teen to a seminary school in Tbilisi, where he began to study for the priesthood in the Georgian Orthodox Church. However, while in the seminary, Stalin began to secretly read German social philosopher Karl Marx's Communist Manifesto. Influenced by the social, economic, and political turmoil of 19th century Europe, Karl Marx and Frederick Engels wrote the infamous manifesto in response to the persecution and exploitation of the common man by the bourgeoisie, who benefited greatly off the hard labor of the proletariat. Whose only real wealth and power was their labor. Marx and Engels called for the proletariat to unify and use their only asset, the labor, 
the bourgeoisie exploited overwhelmingly for their own gain to barter for more equitable employment terms. A teenage star was immediately hooked on Marx and Engels' works and became interested in a revolutionary movement against the Russian monarchy, which treated citizens as serfs who held few, if any, rights. In 1889, Stalin was expelled from his seminary for missing his exams, but he would go on later to claim that his expulsion was for the discovery of what was deemed Marxist propaganda. Whatever the real reason, Stalin's expulsion set him on a collision course with history. And perhaps if a group of priests had been a bit more tolerant, then history and Russia itself would have been spared untold catastrophes to come. So immediately upon his expulsion, Stalin dove headfirst into political activism, becoming an underground political agitator, and taking part in labor demonstrations and work strikes. At this time, he adopted the name of Kova after a fictional Robin Hood like Georgian outlaw hero and became a prominent member of the Marxist Social Democratic Movement's more militant chapter, the Bolsheviks. At the time, the Bolsheviks were being led by Vladimir Lenin, who Stalin would immediately idolize for his fiery passion and determination to set Russia's workers free. Stalin eagerly shared Lenin's dreams of a Russia free of the greed and corruption of capitalism, whose workers shared equitably in the profits of their labor. The worst of the military on white action news was the history's first major update. The British unit. In order to fund this revolutionary movement, however, Stalin became involved in various criminal enterprises to include bank heists, the proceeds of which all went to fund the Bolshevik Party. In 1906, Stalin married Ekaterina Kato Spanitsa, though tragically she would go on to die a year later, shortly after the birth of Stalin's son Yakov from Typhus. Yakov himself would be a similarly tragic fate, dying during World War II as a prisoner in Germany. In 1912, Lenin, who was in exile in Switzerland, appointed Stalin to serve on the first central committee of the Bolshevik Party, securing Stalin's first true grip on power in what would be the future Communist Party of the Soviet Union. A year later, Stalin was arrested and exiled to Siberia, but in 1917, revolution swept across Russia in what would become known as the Russian Revolution, with Stalin playing a prominent role. A vote of the Bolshevik Central Committee of 10 to 2 prompted the Bolsheviks to start planning an armed insurrection after Lenin told committee members that revolution was inevitable. What followed was a struggle that would see the ruling czar and his family ousted from power and then executed, with Lenin leading the way in creating the Russian Socialist Federative Soviet Republic. Republic, the first self-proclaimed socialist state, seen by Lenin as a tough character who could get things done behind the scenes, or in plain speak, a thug who wasn't afraid to kill political enemies or commit atrocities in the name of the cause. Lenin appointed Stalin to a prominent position during the Red Army's invasion of Georgia, where he got the reputation for being specially brutal against any opposition. Eventually, with the Bolshevik Party's expansion of power, it became necessary to expand the scope for the Central Committee. And at the 11th Congress, the position of Secretary of the Central Committee was formed, to which Lenin appointed Stalin on the 3rd of April, 1922. From then on, until his death, Stalin would always be known as General Secretary, though the position was never intended to be as powerful or dictatorial as Stalin would make it into. Briefly disappointed with his appointment after not being given a heavy ministerial post and seeing the early iteration of the general secretary as a relatively weak political position, Stalin quickly learned how to use the new office to influence and gain advantage over other key persons within the Bolshevik party. Eventually, Stalin would grow the power of the office, taking it far outside the scope that Lenin or any of the party's members had ever envisioned for it. A few weeks after Stalin's appointment, Lenin suffered a stroke and was forced into semi-retirement. Initially fully supportive of Stalin as general secretary, Lenin's support would eventually wane when he learned of Stalin's brutality against political opponents, abuse of power, and growing internal party struggles. A report from the invasion in Georgia of violent atrocities committed in the name of the party by supporters of Stalin also soured Lenin's view on this one-time protege, knowing that his death was imminent. Lenin drafted a political bill between December 1922 and January 1923, containing some harsh criticisms of Stalin and fear of fragmentation of the Bolshevik Party. Lenin would go on to die in 1924, throwing the Bolsheviks in disarray and he struggles for power. Stalin, however, took advantage of his position as general secretary to ban the flames of antagonism between political violence. Stalin has eye on power the whole time, but his grace and leader, Julian Trotsky, a prominent member of the party who was the creator of the Soviet.